Hey folks, Dennis Hancock here, Forge Extension Specialist here at the University of Georgia, the grass man, and I'm here today with uh, Dr. Jennifer Tucker, who is our uh, grazing specialist here in South Georgia, doing a lot of grazing research here in Tifton, and uh, she's got something very special planned for today with our fencing field day. So tell us a little bit about what we're doing here with this fencing field day, Jennifer. Um, thank you, Dennis. So uh, today we're having a hands-on fencing field day. Uh, a lot of questions that we have with grazing management uh, really come down to the infrastructure and that's having a good sturdy fence. And so today we wanted to set up an opportunity for our producers to come and really get their hands dirty and pull some of these fences and see what these permanent uh, perimeter lines are. So Jennifer, we're, we're going to be doing this discussion, but this is really more of a conversation more than a presentation, right? I mean, we're, we're going to have all these different stations that we're going to talk about these different things. Um, and, and we have our students here today as well. They're going to be shooting some video. And I guess uh, the take home is we're going to try to stitch all this together to make a, a nice little video montage of the day uh, to get most of the key points. But are there some key things that you want to talk about with regard to uh, this better grazing project as well and some of the things that we're developing here? Uh, yes. So first of all, yes, as you said, this is a conversation, not a presentation. Uh, and so the idea behind this whole field day is it's all outside. We do have the wonderful black shank facility here um, that we are going to be underneath the, the shelter there and discussing. And, and we have this wonderful weather. Hopefully everybody will stay warm enough uh, today for this, uh, this meeting. But we wanted to try a different approach. Uh, and really see uh, how our attendees like not maybe sitting through PowerPoints all day. And, you know, I, I give as many PowerPoints as, as some of us around here. But, um, you know, sometimes you need to really just get in and just talk about certain uh, aspects. And, and this way it really lends itself for that. So we're hoping to have some really good discussions. Uh, but as you mentioned, the Better Grazing Project, we, what we do have is this is the inaugural kickoff, as I'm calling it, for the Better Grazing Program in South Georgia. And so when I first started in Tifton, uh, we had this grazing facility, but it hadn't been utilized uh, in 10 plus years or so. And so uh, the fencing just wasn't up to par and a lot of the, the pastures itself weren't, weren't to the needs of, of my research program. And so what we've seen is an opportunity to create the better grazing program. Uh, starting with our fencing, we are gonna have a demonstration area. So we'll have all different types of fencing and, and create an area for producers to come and see these different fencing uh, options that they would have as they're building the infrastructure for grazing on their farm. Uh, we also have different waters and uh, one of our, um, or a couple of our water guys will be here today and talk about watering systems as well. And so we've already had those donated. So we really appreciate that we're going to have different watering systems, fencing systems to show people. Uh, we will have predominantly Bermuda grass uh, sod as we are in South Georgia, uh, but we are excited about this opportunity to create a research and demonstration area to hopefully be a, a long-term educational tool for grazing management in South Georgia. So one of the other aspects of this is that we're able to put this in, in real world conditions and to try to evaluate some of the the specifications, if you will, some of the um, uh, galvanization types, the, the type of painted post versus galvanized post, the different types of connectors, um, uh, different types of waterers, and even some of those things that are uh, technical standards, say with NRCS, we're, we're going to be able to manipulate that, play around with different ranges of those. Uh, for example, having a distance away from a water that's protected by a heavy use area and whether or not that that distance is, is really necessary or not. And so uh, this, this location is gonna to serve to kind of have multiple purposes kind of superimposed over, over that, in addition to actually looking at some different uh, Bermuda grass combinations here and, and maybe some forage use on, on that as well. Yes, it is. And we're really excited about that opportunity down here in, in South Georgia, so. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, this is our kickoff for the Better Grazing Program here in South Georgia. Uh, it's part of the bigger Better Grazing Project throughout the state of Georgia. They've done a lot of work with Dr. Hancock up in um, Watkinsville. And so the areas that we are building the fence actually are going to be part of a research and demonstration area. So they will be there long term uh, so that we will have different types of fencing for people to look at uh, and through the longevity of those fences and, and the fence life. So we're glad to have all the people here. We also have players from both 
uh, university and NRCS as well as industry. So we get kind of perspective from everywhere. So the people I'm going to introduce real quickly, we have Dr. John Worley, who I call our resident fencing expert. Uh, if I have a fence question, uh, that's who I go to. Uh, he's Professor Meredith with uh, the University of Georgia. Uh, he, he knows a lot of that information. We have Dr. Dennis Hancock. He is our forage extension specialist. Uh, since our focus is grazing, uh, you know, he knows a lot about uh, different types of fencing. Uh, he's going to be our moderator for the, the morning and kind of keep us hopefully on track. <laughs> uh, I have Mr. Philip Brown. Brown, right? Yep. Uh, Philip Brown with the NRCS. He's our grazing specialist. Uh, he's going to go through here in just a minute uh, with what our EQIP standards are because I know a lot of us when it comes to building fence, you know, we want to make sure that we're trying to meet those EQIP standards. Uh, and that'll be kind of our theme too throughout the day is does this or does this not, would this meet uh, what EQIP will do. So he'll be our EQIP answer guy. Uh, we have Mr. Andy Dunn. He is our beef unit specialist here down in, our beef unit manager, you're a specialist down here. Uh, in, uh, in Tipton and in the Lapa Hall. Uh, so Andy and I work very closely together and he wants me to tell everybody that he is not a fencing expert, but a cattle containment specialist. Uh, so he is successful at keeping cows in the areas they're supposed to be. Uh, so that's, that's Andy for us. Uh, for our industry, we have Mr. Mike Taylor uh, with State Cuff Fence, uh, Mr. Brad Ross with Hatcher Management Systems. I always want to call it solutions. Uh, and Rob Amundsen, is that correct? Yes, with Richie Water, so we are going to have waterers out that we're going to talk about. So uh, ask these guys questions throughout the day. Uh, I also want to go ahead and point out uh, that Richie Water is our first gold sponsor for the Better Grazing program. So we want to thank you for that. We really appreciate uh, all of that uh, as, as we have the support from our industry. Uh, so it's hard to look at an aerial photograph and get it exactly right the first time. And, and, and frankly, to be honest with you, you know, uh, the work that NRCS does is great, but if you just show up the first time and plan out something on, on their computer and their GIS system, and you go out and you put it in place, and you've never dabbled with fencing before, you're gonna be really disappointed in how that turns out because, you know, looking at it from above is not necessarily gonna be the way that it actually works in practice down on the ground. But you can see the, the options, you've got, you can have a six inch hole, or a four inch hole, or a two inch hole, or a three inch, like what we have here. And uh, then the options from 35 inches to 10 feet tall, so there's 50 different varieties of fence that you'd have to choose from, depending on what your, your situation is. And what's different about this, that a lot of you probably haven't seen, it's called a fixed knot fence. But that knot is locked on there, it won't move either direction. So wild hogs, horses, goats, whatever, they can't move the knot, so they can't work a hole in the fence. So those are some of the, the advances in, in fencing since uh, 30 years ago. But when you're putting up fence anywhere, the main thing is don't drive your staples all the way into the post. Leave it where that wire can slide, because when a tree falls on this, then a tree's gonna fall on it. It'll smash it flat, but you've got the whole length of the fence for this to give. Each one of these little bumps here is called a tension crimp. And basically it makes it like a giant spring. It, it, it has, wire, high tensile wire has memory. So when something falls on it, it'll pinch that out, but it'll pull itself back together once you get the pressure on it. So that's the, the, one of the big advantages to high tensile. That, in fact, you can put your post further apart. And uh, the, the, the savings, the wire costs a little more, but the savings isn't, isn't using half as many fence posts and half the labor. I'm a member of ASABE, the American Society of Agricultural and Biological Engineers. We've tried to come up with standards on how to compare energizers and so on, and we never could get all the manufacturers to agree on it because some of them look better under one set way of testing and some of them look better on the other way. I, that's my guess anyway, but, but at any rate, some of them are compared based on joules, amount of energy that it, that it applies to, to the animal and so forth. Some of them can be rated. The ASABE standard is, is you put a resistance out there. A high resistance would mean a good fence. A low resistance would mean a fence that deteriorated a lot. You want something that'll still give you a good voltage when that when that resistance gets down. 
if you look at the ratings on here, and that will, will help you compare it. I will say mileage, you'll see that on some boxes, and you know, it may be a way for them to, for the, the manufacturer to, to compare one of their chargers with another, but I've seen two chargers in one store that both of them said 10 miles and one of them was like $40 and the other one was $100 and that was a lot of difference in those and they both had the same rate. So mileage, I, I just kind of ignore that except if you're comparing two from the same manufacturer. But you know, look at their rating, look at, at, at uh, something that will hold up well at a low resistance as, as the fence deteriorates. You want something that'll still give you a good charge. Uh, other than that, you know, price is a, is a good way to compare. Usually you get, you get what you pay for. It's not always, but it's usual. Yeah, just when, you're, when you are selecting that, you know, look at your, at your jewel rate. You know, I can't emphasize that enough of what they've said. And, you know, I've got a, a topic I'll do at different meetings that I talk about energizer selection. And the majority of y'all, if I ask you a question, if you're trying to select the energizer, what's the first thing you look at when you go in there to, to pick a charger? How many miles does it do? How many acres does it do? Or maybe if it's got a dog in the package, you know, I don't know. Um, but, you know, so a lot of times I, I said, all right, when you find the miles and acres, and I don't, I don't work for True Test, I don't work for Gallagher, and I, I'm trying to aggravate Michael here, but... I said, when you find the miles and acres, I said, throw it out the window. Let's just pay it no attention. So, and, and look at that jewel rating as your horsepower and torque in the Energizer. You know, the more horsepower, the more torque we can turn out, the more of a load we can carry. And a load is more fence. A load is weeds growing on it. Um, so, you know, look at that when you're selecting an Energizer. Um, a good, I think, conservative, safe rule of thumb to look at when somebody comes up to me, whether we're at the Sunbelt Expo or wherever, you know, um, they, they, need a, they need an energizer. You know, most of the time it starts off, I need a good hot charger, but I need the cheapest one you got. <laughs> so well, you just kind of need to walk off and decide what's going to work for you. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll come back again. But, you know, um, look, look at that jewel rating, like I say, and, uh, you know, try to decide what's going to work for you. Jewel rating is, I, I agree, it's, it's the best way to, yeah. to compare them. But the problem is that people, when people go in, they say, this one's six jewel, this one's eight jewel, how much do I need? Yeah, yeah. and that's, and that's, where, that's, that's where, where I was going with that. I like, to, as a good conservative rule of thumb, I like to figure 20 to 25 acres of multi-strand fencing per one output jewel. If you're getting in to put it up that you're thinking, buy more box than you need because you're going to add on to it. Yeah. That, that's a good point. And, uh, and like Brad and Dr. Worley were saying, you got to look at, okay, how, what's my what's my management going to be to maintain this fence? I mean, am I going to am I gonna have time to keep the weeds off of it? Yeah, that's key. Then, then if you ain't, then you need to step up to a, a higher jewel step because up. that's where your jewels really come into play. Uh, yeah. And we're green, talking green weeds and green grass that suck the energy right out of the fence and hurt. So, talking about rotational grazing, if you're going to be putting poly wire out there, that adds more resistance on there. You know, you need more horsepower, more joules to help, uh, you know, push the voltage through that. So that's something to, to you know, consider and all as well when you're selecting the energizer. Like I said, what is going to meet your needs? How big of an area are we doing? Are we going to add on and grow to it? Are we going to be using some poly? Uh, you know, all factors to keep in mind there on, on that as well. Well, it, it don't really matter which box you buy. If you don't ground it right, you still ain't got nothing. Right. Yeah, and that's yeah another thing that you can probably, jump into is grounding. Probably 80% of the phone calls that we get in our home office in Texas and they send to me about electric fence problems is the ground. And you start finding out what they got it grounded with, how many, what material they use, rebar, a water pot, don't don't water casing doesn't doesn't really cut it. <laughs> and the bigger the box, the more ground rods we we need. And I mean we make a 36 joule energizer. And I mean how many, how many ground rods do they recommend for that? Well we 
We, I'd say probably 20. And soil conditions can play a factor into that as well. You know, if, in, you know, if you're in more of a, you know, a clay-based soil that's retaining and holding some moisture compared to a sandy soil that's this more well-drained, you know, that plays a factor into it. So, you know, I would say if, if somebody gives you a recommendation and you start with that, then you can come back and test it to see if you've got enough ground rots. Um, and I think in the back of that Stay Fix catalog that I've got over here, it talks about testing your ground. Um, essentially what you're going to do is go out there on the fence line, short your fence out, you know, until you've got the voltage just drug down into the dirt here, and then go check the voltage on your last ground rod. If you've got, say, four ground rods hooked up in parallel, check the voltage on that last ground rod, uh, because that, that, that short, if, if that energizer is going to end up, you know, I guess you'd say back feeding, it's going to throw it out on the ground side. If you've got a sufficient enough ground, it keeps that from happening and pushes it all to the fence. So you can test that. If you're going to buy an expensive energizer, go buy you a, a decent little surge protector because about probably 80% of the, the lightning strikes that get hit an energizer come through the AC side. Okay? Now, that doesn't mean you can get away without putting a you know, a lightning arrestor on the fence, but, you know, we, we say to put one at least 100 yards away from the energizer. If you've got a, you know, depending on the on the size of the fence, you, you might end up, I mean, if you're fencing out, or if you've got three or 400 acres of fence, you might need three or four lightning arrestors. Yeah. And, you know, one factor I look at, like Michael said, the majority of your energizers that get knocked out by lightning get hit on the 110 power supply side. So, Put a, put a surge protector there to, uh, to take care of that. Um, you know, and then if you're looking on the fence side on protecting it, if lightning hits, what's it looking to go to? A ground. All right, so let's say that we had an electric fence coming out and hit this tree and jumping on our fence. All right, and it goes you know, through the box and it goes out into those ground rods. So the biggest you know, mistake I see that people will make if they put a, a, um, you know, a lightning diverter or something out there on their fence line is they don't ground it enough or properly. And you know, so I've had guys, well I got a lightning arrestor out there. How many ground rods you got on? I got I got one I got it put up right I got I got a ground rod up to it. Okay, one, yeah, just I got one ground rod on it. How many ground rods you got on your charger? Well it's got three or four or five, whatever. I said, so you got a stronger ground field over here than you do on your lightning protection. And you're trying to divert the lightning over here to one ground rod when it's got four or five over here. You know, so what you want to essentially do is I like to say you want to have at least one extra ground rod on your diversion system versus what's hooked into your energizer. Well, that's a lot of ground rods. Well, yeah, that is a lot of ground rods, but do you want to protect it or not protect it? You know, it's kind of like if, if you're not willing to go and put five or six ground rods on it, there's really no need to even mess with putting, I say one, I guess it might help a, a minimal, you know, but, you know, you want to have a stronger ground field over there. Um, Otherwise, you're just telling it to go through the charger. Yeah, I mean, that's where you're you're luring it to, you know. One, one illustration I've used, talking about lightning and so forth. Most people know that in a car or a pickup truck or something, it's about the safest place you can be in a lightning storm. But most people don't understand why. You ask them, why are you safer in a car? They think, well, I got rubber tires on there so the, so the lightning can get through those rubber tires. It's going to insulate that lightning just jumped 2,000 feet from a cloud to the top of that car, that little bit of insulation between you and the ground is not going to stop it. The reason you're safe is because it shunts the electricity through the steel around the car, around you, and it, and it is going to go to the ground. So what? Like, you're not going to stop lightning. What you have to do is provide a good path for it to go where you want it to go, which is not through the thing. So you need to have a better grounding field for your for your lightning protection than you get for your charge. Mm -hmm.
we're going to do is put in the brace wire. And as he was saying a while ago, there's only one right way to put the brace wire in, and that's from the top of the brace post to the bottom of the end post. And you have a seat. Phillip's going to drive a. Uh, what was that? I do. Staple down there. Trying to keep our brace wire on the control down at the bottom. And we're using 12 and a half gauge high tensile electric fence wire for our brace wire. And the next thing we're going to do is start putting a little tension on this. go ahead and tighten this on up to as tight as we wanted to get it. But what we like to do, now this is a, a boundary fence. The fence is going to be on the, the inside of the post, so this really doesn't make any difference. But if this was a, a cross fence, you've got a place here where animals can get their feet stuck in. So what we do, we try to eliminate that. So we take a little short piece of wire. wraps around it. And in 20 minutes time, if your drill works, um, you've, got, you've got a brace bit. Be modest to check, see if that's tight. You're welcome to play with it or whatever. We're going to wrap these line wires around here, and uh, then we're going to tie them so in a slip knot so the, the wire can move around this post as we, as we tension it down there. And what Philip's going to do is demonstrate a different way to do this. Now, the, the biggest difference is this didn't cost anything. And those are about a dollar and a quarter a piece. But they're easier, you say. Oh, yeah. When it's 100 in the shade and the fire ants are bad, a dollar and a quarter is nothing. Right. Especially since the gripple people give them to us for free. <laughs> hard to, to see probably but it works like a, uh, a Chinese finger trap. The wire will go through one direction but won't back out. you'll pull, if you've got most of the slack out of it, you'll pull about one foot for every hundred feet of wire that you've got out on the, on the high tensile fence. So I tried to, to figure on a six feet plus a little bit to leave us some room to work when we're done. And hopefully we don't come together in the middle before we get tight.
driving this pin in right here, I like to leave just a little bit of that brace pin sticking out. And that way, whether it's a brace wire or we're going to, you know, show this cable right here now, that gives you something for it to rest on right here. So um, I usually like to leave a little bit of that brace pin sticking out. The uh, This cable right here is manufactured by a company called Gripple. Um, you saw some of the T-clips used on the end of the uh, fix knot fence up there a while ago. They also have a, uh, a gripple that, this is a large that's used on this cable. They have a medium that's used on uh, 10 to 14 gauge smooth wire. It'll also work on a uh, 15 and a half gauge barbed wire as well. So um, what we're going to do on this, um, I did drive a staple in the end down here, and really the only reason I did that was just to make sure it doesn't try to slide up the post. Once you get pressure or tension on it, it's going to bite into that wood, um, and it's not really going to slide up anyway. So different opinions, you know. Um, some people will thread it through the staple. You could do that. There again, I look at, I want to do something that's quick, simple, easy, fast. So what I'm going to do with this cable is I'm going to come on around the post with it, and then uh, you're going to take the, the tail end of this uh, cable. You're going to come back through the loop right here, and that's going to cinch it up. Like I said, I didn't worry about going through the staple. I just try to come back and get up underneath it. And then that way it's kind of hanging it so it doesn't try to ride back up that post. So um, once, what part I'm at here? I'm out here dancing here. <laughs> <laughs> once, uh, once you've got that cinched up on there, the, the gripple right here, like I said, there's two different sides. I mean, it doesn't really matter which end you're going on, but you're going to slide it in. As you can see, it's going to slide down, but it's not it's not coming back up. It's a, it's a kind of a one-way device. Now, one thing they have done now is, is you can back these up or release them. So if you slide it down too far, um, and I've used a paper clip before, but they've got a, uh, a little release key that, that you can get for these things. And if you put it in, it what it does is is it backs up that uh that little roller, it's a ceramic roller in here. So when you hold pressure on it, freeze it, and I can back it back off here. If there's no pressure on it. If there's no pressure, it's a lot easier, yeah. If there's pressure, it's about a six-handed job to try to get one loose. <laughs> um, you know, it can be done, but you gotta take the tool and try to hold it, and it's it's an aggravating. Um, so anyway, but yeah, you can back these back off so. When you run it down, and, and I know they had talked earlier about, you know, not having that, that gap in between your brace wire and all. That's one nice thing about this, that it does eliminate. So you'll slide your, uh, slide your gripple down. I usually like to, uh, I usually like to run it down here 12, 18 inches below the, the brace post right here. Come back to the tail end. Gonna go into, into the other slot or hole right here on this gripple. And pulling it in, like I say, there again, it's, it's locked in the same direction. So uh, I'm going to make sure it's set up here on top of that brace pin. So at that point, we've done all we can do by hand. And then the, the tensioning tool, what you'll do with this, this is more of a contractor grade tool. There's a torque tool that I had on the, on the table up there at the pavilion. Uh, when you open this tool up, you open it all the way. Most people will stop right here, but you want to open it up to where it pushes this this cam right here is going to push open. So right there where you push the cam open, you'll come back and you'll get hold of the uh, of the tail end of the of the cable right here, and you'll slide this on up to your gripple. And then what we're going to do is is start to tighten it up right here. As we start to come in, we're tensioning that cable and, and start to pull it tight. And you can come back and, and get you another bite. Something that, and this one's pretty well in the center, something I've, I've seen just over time. I usually like to come back and take my foot and kind of kick this over. Um, you see it's, it's starting to snug up here. Sometimes you can kick that thing over a little bit. This one isn't going to move much here now, and it'll loosen back up. So that way just over time it's not going to get loose on you. I was working on it from this side a while ago. If we start to get this gripple too far up, you can you can operate it from the other side as well. Same same kind of deal. Open it up. Gonna put it on on the cable. Slide it down, and you can work it from this side right here as well. And tension it, tighten it up. So that's something like say you can see. It's a, it's a very just quick, simple 
pathway to it. Um, once I get done, um, you can see we've got a little bit of extra slack here. I don't want to come back and just cut it off flush. If you ever needed to come back and, and retension it or anything like that, I usually like to try to leave a you know a tail on the end of it here. So um, we're talking about these Nipex pliers a while ago. I mean, you can cut the uh, cut this cable with them and all as well. You can just pinch it down a little bit, do a couple bites on it. So uh, anyway, but that's that speed brace kit. I mean, it's a it's a very Quick, simple, fast, easy way to do your to do your braces on there. So find out. Now you can just sit there right here, real There you go. Just stand still, let it reel in. Now, if you're doing some stockpiling and you're trying to do this in a hurry, trying to uh, get out there. Okay, well. <laughs> Now, now stop the stopwatch. We'll see how quick it is. Let you show the young buck up there. <laughs> So we hope you've enjoyed this video montage from our fencing field day. We've had a wonderful day today with some great weather and wonderful participation. Uh, hopefully you'll stay tuned to future vlogs as we introduce other opportunities that we're going to have with hands-on educational opportunities here at the Better Grazing Program in Tifton, Georgia. Yeah, we got a lot of things planned for down here, including uh, grazing schools and other kinds of major events. So stay tuned for that. So for that, uh, we'll just sign off. We'll see you down the road.